Coming up on today's Airborne, the FAA issues the final rules on pilot training. A privately owned New Jersey airport faces a government takeover. And Bombardier announces the first U.S. Super Scooper aircraft sale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. New pilot training rules have been issued by the FAA that will affect pilots training for the Airline Transport Pilot Certificate and those pilots that are already employed by an airline. The final rule stems in part from the crash of Colgan Air 3407 in February of 2009 and addresses a congressional mandate in the Airline Safety and Federal Aviation Administration Extension Act of 2010. Today's rule is one of several rulemakings required by the act, including the requirement to prevent pilot fatigue and to increase qualification requirements for first officers who fly U.S. passenger and cargo planes. The FAA is focusing on pilot training for events that, although rare, are often catastrophic. The recent rule boosts pilot qualifications for first officers and raises the baseline knowledge and skill set of pilots entering air carrier operations. The final rule requires ground, simulator, and flight training regarding the prevention of and recovery from aircraft stalls and upsets. It also requires expanded training for handling crosswinds, coping with wind gusts, and runway safety procedures. Air carriers must now use data to track remedial training for pilots with performance deficiencies and train for more effective pilot monitoring. Air carriers will have five years to comply with the rule's new pilot training provisions. The private owners of Solberg Airport, a public-use airport in Runnington Township, New Jersey, have been fighting an ongoing legal battle with the Township Board that's attempting to take over the airport through eminent domain laws. While the Township Committee says they want to preserve the airport in its current use, others say that the Township has wanted to have the land and surrounding property for development for years. An ANN reader sent an email indicating that the Township Committee has been trying to take over the airport for some time, but is now seeking to condemn the entire airport in order to, quote, preserve it. The AOPA has also weighed in on the matter. A letter from AOPA Vice President of Airports, Bill Dunn, to the mayor and members of the committee said in part, quote, We believe the time has come for the township to cease and desist in efforts to take the airport from the Solberg family. If the town is indeed concerned with preserving the airport and protecting the airport from encroachment from non-conforming uses, then why not enter into agreement with the family since it would appear that they have the same goals, end quote. Bombardier has announced the sale and delivery of its 50th Bombardier 415 Super Scooper firefighting aircraft, assembled at its North Bay, Ontario facility. The aircraft, purchased by a partnership led by Tinax Aerospace of Ridgeland, Mississippi, will be used under contract to the United States Forest Service starting next month. The Bombardier 415 Super Scooper aircraft is a firefighter able to adapt to the roughest terrain, and it's the only aircraft specifically built as an aerial firefighting airplane. It's able to land on unpaved runways, lakes, rivers, and seas, enabling both rapid initial attacks to extinguish fires and sustained attacks to contain fires. This 50th Bombardier 415 aircraft to roll out of North Bay, Ontario, is the first to be sold to a United States customer. A total of five state and privately owned CL215 aircraft, the predecessor to the Bombardier 415 aircraft, are currently operated in the U.S. After the disastrous fire season this year, this new aircraft will be a welcome addition to our firefighting arsenal. At the birthplace of the SR-71 Blackbird, Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works, Engineers are developing a hypersonic aircraft that will go twice the speed of the SR-71. It's called the SR-72. Envisioned as an unmanned aircraft, the SR-72 would fly at speeds of up to Mach 6. At this speed, the aircraft would be so fast, an adversary would have no time to react or hide. 
For the past several years, Lockheed Martin Skunk Works has been working with Aerojet Rocketdyne to develop a method to integrate an off-the-shelf turbine with a supersonic combustion ramjet air-breathing jet engine to power the aircraft from standstill to Mach 6. The result is the SR-72. Seven U.S. Senators, led by Kansas Republican Pat Roberts, have sent a letter to the Acting Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Rand Beers, requesting an explanation for a rise in unwarranted stops and searches by Customs and Border Protection of U.S. General Aviation aircraft that had not crossed the U.S. border. Roberts said, quote, there is a lot of justified frustration from pilots who feel their constitutional rights have been violated. We need to know all of the facts behind these stops and searches to ensure our constituents are not being unlawfully singled out by the federal government." End quote. The letter recognized the important work performed by the Customs and Border Protection agents and also stated that the senators understand the laws allowing ramp checks. But the letter added, quote, However, we wholly disagree with agents demanding access to certain aircraft without reasonable suspicion or probable cause that an illegal activity is occurring." End quote. The senators have requested a complete account of all stop and searches of general aviation aircraft since the beginning of 2009. Last week, we reported that Boeing is reducing 747-8 production. And now we hear that Airbus is faced with a similar situation with its A380 because of a lack of demand for jumbo jets. Air France is reportedly considering dropping orders for some of the A380 airliners it has in the pipeline in favor of other Airbus aircraft. The move comes as Airbus has already lost two A380 orders from Lufthansa and Virgin Atlantic and has also postponed delivery of six A380s to 2016. Airbus has not landed a single order for its flagship airplane this year. The plane maker has opened production slots for A380s as early as 2015. Universal Avionics has named Mr. Paul De Herrera to the position of Chief Executive Officer for the company. Mr. De Herrera, with more than 40 years of aviation experience, began his career with Universal Avionics in 1994 in the position of Manager of OEM Marketing at the company's headquarters located in Tucson, Arizona. He then transitioned into the position of Vice President of Marketing and Product Support before being promoted to his most recent position of Chief Operating Officer in January of 2008. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Redbird Skyport is a multifaceted aviation laboratory charged with developing innovative solutions to the issues facing the industry. It started out as a vision for a laboratory where we could objectively measure the systems and the processes that we were developing. Being able to put some objective measures behind the anecdotal evidence that we have about the value of motion and the application of this technology is very, very important because until we can objectively measure it and play that data back, we can't design training systems that make the best use of it. For more information about Redbird Flight Simulations as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com or www.redbirdskyport.com. Rebuilding the sport aviation world one aviator at a time. That's ANN's new Aerosports ebook series, your resource guide to the ultimate in aviation adventures. Aerosport will feature the straight skinny on learning and enjoying 16 unique aviation sports, from ultralights and ballooning to aerobatics, gyroplanes and hang gliders to parachuting, home builds and general aviation to RC models. All this and more will be coming soon with the new updatable Aerosport guide for your favorite electronic devices. Get your advance order in now at www. Aero-sport.net. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. Boeing is officially supporting pilot Tracy Curtis Taylor 
on her 7,000 mile solo journey in a reconditioned Boeing Stearman open cockpit biplane to retrace Lady Mary Heath's historic 1928 flight between South Africa and the United Kingdom. Heath was the first pilot, male or female, to make such a journey. Curtis Taylor, a UK-based pilot, departed Cape Town on November 2nd with plans to land in Goodwood near London in December. She's flying a refurbished 1942 Stearman named Spirit of Artemis after sponsor Artemis Investments. Chris Chadwick, Boeing military aircraft president, said, quote, We hope this journey inspires people along the route to learn more about the remarkable history of aviation and the role Boeing has played in the past, as well as the important role we play in African aviation today, end quote. More than 8,500 Boeing Stearmans were built in the United States during the 1930s and 1940s. The airplane was the primary trainer for the U.S. Air Force and Navy during World War II. The Technam team gathered last Friday in Capua, Italy to celebrate the 90th birthday of pilot, aircraft designer, entrepreneur, and Technam's leading light, Professor Luigi Pascal. Luigi Gino Pascal is a native of Naples, Italy whose passion for aviation began during the 1930s when, with his brother Giovanni Nino, they won many model plane races. The two brothers built their first aircraft, the P-48 Astor, which flew on the 2nd of April, 1951. After founding Partenavia in 1957, he began building general aviation planes for everyone. Aircraft such as the P-64 Oscar and P-66, which became bestsellers and firm favorites as training aircraft and led to his innovative P-68 light twin design. In 1986, the two Pascal brothers founded Technam, and Professor Pascal's first design for Technam, the P-92, has now flown 200,000 hours with over 2,500 in service worldwide. We at ANN say happy birthday to Professor Pascal and offer our thanks for all he has done for aviation. Well, it's Friday and time for this week's barnstorming commentary. Today, Jim's head is full of thoughts and ideas from all the activity of MBAA and the Redbird migration. Here's barnstorming. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. Well, with the 2013 Redbird Migration Flight Training Conference now safely in the rearview mirror, I have to tell you we're working off a bit of a high. Good things happened. Great people were thinking great thoughts. A lot of people were thinking way outside the box. And it was obvious that innovation, if anything else, is potentially the greatest possible savior of aviation and aviation's future. Let's face it, we've been doing the same thing for far too long. And the, quote, that's the way we've always done it mindset really, really needs to be stamped out once and for all. Okay, all that's well and good. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here is very simple. We have to develop a new mindset. And while I'll use succeeding weeks to talk about the innovation process and a couple of other uh, mindsets that are going to be necessary to be espoused by the aviation community, let me put one first and foremost, and it's one near and dear to my heart. It's one that kind of made, well, made us what we are, activism. Very simple, folks. When you see something wrong, you need to speak out. When something is wrong, you need to try to correct it. When you have something that's near and dear to your heart and it's not doing well, you have to get off your duff and try to do something to bring it up, bring about a positive change so that it might have a positive future and more important, a positive effect on all those involved in that activity. Aviation is filled with people who talk about it a little, worry about it a lot, and don't speak out loud. We have a number of folks that are very smart and for one reason or another, just don't speak up. And God help you if you are one of the guys who speaks up because, well, <laughs> I can tell you from personal experience, it's not the easiest thing in the world to be on the pointy end of the spear. Activism is one of the three key things, in my opinion, that will save aviation. The other being innovation and rebuilding the community. In no uncertain terms, we need to stand up for ourselves. In no uncertain terms, we need to speak out. In no uncertain terms, when others speak out, we need to support them 
even when we disagree, we need to engage them in conversations and engage them in dialogue in order to make those concerns a larger part of the conversation, more important, a common portion of the consciousness of a community struggling to survive. Give you a good example. You'll hear stories this week about Solberg Airport. This is a family-run airport. It's been there for decades. I'm a former New Jersey native. I learned to fly at Lincoln Park and the now defunct Hanover. Solberg was this marvelous little place that I used to fly into. But the town around it has been trying to kill it since I was a teenager. Uh, they have been doing everything they possibly can to shut it down. And the plain fact of the matter now is they're, they're trying to use eminent domain to quote unquote buy the airport so they can save it. We all know what they're really trying to do is engineer a future in which they can slowly but surely strangle the airport and turn it into condos or turn it into development or whatever the case may be. Solberg deserves to survive. Solberg is a victim of $5 million in expenditures, tax money, mind you, spent by Reddington to try to snuff it out. Activism will save Solberg, standing up and speaking out, getting active, telling Reddington in no uncertain terms, if you want our business, you want our money, you want our support, don't kill your airport. In no uncertain terms, Reddington needs to understand that eminent domain, in this particular case, is nothing less than theft. And activists will stand up and, say, and accuse them of just that. And I am now. Reddington, you're trying to steal the Solberg Airport. We're not going to let it happen. Speak up, folks. Be activists. Be ready. Because surely, as Solberg may be the issue of the moment, there's another one right around the corner. And only the activists, only the folks who are willing to speak up, We'll let you know and let the community know when it's time to raise our voices as one. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell, speaking up as always. Take care. A woman at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport Friday got quite a surprise when she noticed a two-foot alligator lurking under an escalator. She immediately alerted Tanika Walker, an airport security guard. Walker told a local TV station that the gator was captured by placing a trash can over it. The animal was reportedly moving pretty slowly because of the cold airport floor. Or perhaps it just fell asleep because of the long TSA lines. Anyways, it was removed by the Chicago Herpetological Society. Best guess is that a traveler ditched the gator before going through security. Well, that's our program. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Please join us again next Tuesday for a new edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.